seterusnya adalah ceramah dalam bahasa Inggris yang berjudul Islamic System of Governance Established by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ataupun sistem pemerintahan yang diadakan oleh Nabi Besar Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam oleh Tuan Ayas Ahmad Singapura. 30 minutes. Assalamualaikum. <coughs> Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahduhu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Inna Allah ya'muru bil 'adli wal ihsani wa ita'izil qurba وَيَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغْيِ يَعِيذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ Respected Chairman, Special Guests, Brothers and Sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Waalaikum salam. 570 AD, the year of birth of the mercy of mankind, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 610 AD, at the age of 40 years old, he received divine revelation in the town of Mecca as a prophet of Allah, and this was the year, birth year of Islam. 710 AD, 100 years after the Holy Prophet's first revelation, Islam had spread as far as China and India on the one side and as far as Spain on the other side. The whole of the Persian Empire was gone and was now part of the wider Islamic nation and the Roman Empire, which ruled most of the world so powerfully for centuries, had lost half its hold to the Islamic Empire. The question is, how was this possible? What was the formula used that allowed such a rapid revolution, not only in the Arab world, but close to half the world in a hundred years? Certainly, it was not the military strength of the Muslims that allowed them to win the hearts of men. It was the introduction of putting into practice principles of absolute justice, freedom of religion and expression, equality and fairness, which resulted in peace all over the Islamic empire. It allowed a phenomenal progression in areas of education and healthcare, where people would travel from all over the world, including from Western countries, to learn from teachers and scholars. However, what was the system used that allowed this growth to take place so swiftly, without any bloodshed, and how did their effects stand the test of time? <coughs> To answer this in detail, brothers and sisters, I would like to explain the principles of the Islamic government, which were used to help achieve inter-religious peace, social peace, economic peace, and international peace. We look back at the characteristics of a true Islamic government, as established by the Holy Prophet ﷺ. Before going further, it is important for us to understand what are the teachings of Islam with respect to governance of a state? <coughs> Contrary to many false notions and fears, Islam does not endorse any one political system and no single system of governance has been prescribed in the Holy Quran and neither is any system condemned. Since Islam claims to be a universal religion, it caters for all systems and for all societies which may need different type of systems at different periods of time. An Islamic nation has given the government freedom to choose whatever political system that best fits the society at the right period of time. However, 
the grant does make a recommendation which supports the concept of a democracy by advising the citizens of an Islamic nation to elect their government democratically through consultation. The Holy Quran has laid out three basic core principles and it was these very three principles that the Holy Prophet وسلم, applied when he became a head of state. Number one, the government must function on the principles of absolute justice at all times, even if this means going against your own national interests. Number two, the government must be based on trust and integrity. And number three, the, the administration matters must be decided through consultation. It is therefore very clear that an Islamic nation, anybody elected in a position in a government must be elected with integrity and that the chosen candidate, whether he or she is a prime minister, a president or a king or queen, understands that he, he or she doesn't have sovereignty over anyone or anything since this is reserved wholly for Allah and that it has only been given to him or her as a trust. It is also clear in Islam that the voter is not the master of his vote. He is merely a trustee and is responsible and answerable to God. The choice must be based on moral integrity of the candidate and not on superficial impression and self-proclamation. There should also be no party politics that distract from the individual's role and responsibility. The right to rule equally belongs to all the people and therefore Islam says that they should elect the best person from among themselves as their leader. The appointed head of state must fulfill the trust given to him through justice and equi equi equity, discharging political and government decisions in consultation by the people. However, even in the current era, as the veto, veto power is generally accepted in exceptional circumstances, Islam too has afforded the head of state the power to reject a proposal made by majority if he deems necessary. In other words, in the matter of sovereignty, Islam has prohibited a hereditary system and forbidden that a ruler should lead a despotic and autocratic system of government. People are not allowed to put their own names forward as candidates for election and neither are they allowed to demand a position of authority. Rather, they have to be selected by the choice of the people. This wonderful principle can be seen practically in the life of the Holy Prophet One of the companions of the Holy Prophet wanted a position of authority and begged the Holy Prophet to be, gov to be appointed as a governor. His response to this request was a, clear and, was, a, was a clear and sent a very clear message to all future leaders. He reminded that governance is a trust. And as mentioned in the Holy Quran, it is a trust that the people of the nation collectively choose to put into someone, which brings with it heavy obligation to rule justly. Throughout his life, he maintained this principle, never to appoint anyone into the position of authority who desires to be in office. I would like you all to imagine the profound wisdom of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. This very principle attacks the root of all corruption and the greed for power. His philosophy was that citizens of the nation should select their leader based on his or her capability to lead impartially and honorably, not based on how badly he or she yearns to be the leader. This broadens Islam's protection against despotism and corrupt dictatorship by empowering the people to consult and guide the person they elected as their leader. The Holy Quran says that good leaders are those who hearken to their Lord and observe prayer and whose affairs are decided by mutual consultation and who spend out of that which we have provided for them chapter 40, 42 verse 39 when muhammad wasallam, was given state authority after migrating to medina the holy quran records a revelation he received instructing him to seek consultation in state affairs from 
all the non-Muslims and even those people as, in, uh, as described in the Quran as hypocrites. Allah tells the Holy Prophet وسلم, in the Quran that, and I quote, pardon them and ask for forgiveness for them and consult them in matters of administration. And when thou art resolved, then put thy trust in Allah. Surely Allah loves those who put their trust in Him. Thus, as a ruler over the state, the Holy Prophet وسلم, was instructed to forgive the hypocrites and to seek their consultation as fellow citizens for the good of the state. What a wonderful example of how to keep matters of faith separate from matters of the state. Indeed, during one of the defensive battles that he fought, 300 citizens of the state of Medina <coughs> that he governed abandoned the Muslims on the battlefield. This resulted in a major defeat. He not only forgave each and every single one of those people, he further consulted with them, asking for their opinions on matters of state without any ill feelings and maintained high standard of justice at all times. Indeed, it is important to note that despite the Holy Prophet وسلم, being uninterested to become a head of state, he was chosen as head of state by the overwhelming majority of citizens, including the Jews and other non-Muslims. This goes to show that in a true Islamic government, not only do all citizens have a choice in who to elect, but they can also elect a non-Muslim. The key is that you give your vote to the person who is most suitable for the position according to the principles I've mentioned today. The Holy Prophet وسلم, was an exemplary leader and was the Quran personified. He put into practice one of Islam's directives to refrain from using religion to govern the law of the land. He made sure that as a governor, his primary responsibility was to protect the rights protect the property and protect the dignity of his people. Governments today like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan that monitor and force and punish people for their level of adherence to religious practices fundamentally violate the Quranic commandment in the verse that states La ikraha fid deen There is no compulsion in matters of religion. This means that under no circumstances should anyone be forced to accept anyone else's religion and its religious practices. We must keep in mind that this verse was revealed when the Holy Prophet وسلم, was already the head of state. Since this verse was sent after Muhammad وسلم, was already in position of authority, clearly points to the fact that no government should use religion in legislation. In fact, the very first treaty of Islam was the one settled by the Holy Prophet وسلم, after his migration to Medina with the Jewish people who were resident there. The very foundation of this treaty was based on the principles of religious freedom and tolerance. We also find that when the Jewish tribe of Khaybar and the Christians of Najran entered the Islamic State, the Holy Prophet وسلم, granted them complete freedom in both belief and in practice. There is a narration that when the Christian delegation came to Medina to discuss matters of state, the Holy Prophet وسلم, gave them freedom and permission to perform their worship in the Holy Mosque of Medina, the second holiest site for Muslims. Just imagine for a moment, Medina, an Islamic government state, giving all citizens the, the right to practice their faith freely and not forcing the religion of Islam on anyone else. In fact, there are Islamic civic <coughs> movements in certain Western countries that are against the possibility of Sharia law being, interest, uh, in being implemented in democratic countries. They, however, do not realize that a true Islamic nation is built upon the same principles as a democratic government and is palatable to a secular society. It is important to understand that during the Holy Prophet ﷺ's time, Sharia law had been adopted in its true sense as rule of the land and had made a very clear distinction that religion had no right to interfere in matters of the government and likewise the chosen government had no right to interfere in matters relating to religion. 
those countries like Sudan, Saudi, Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan, which have legislated their religious scholars' opinions and made it into the law of the land, are not following the concept of a true Islamic government. As such, some of these nations have wrongly restricted freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, and equal rights. Due to these un-Islamic laws that have nothing to do with the Sharia, there have been unfortunate cases of death by stoning, honor killings, limited education for women, religious policing, death for apostasy, etc., etc. The other major part of the Islamic governance which strikes fear in the hearts of people is the punishment for crime. This is again a wrongly understood concept and has become an area of contention for many, many Western scholars who have attacked Islam on this basis. When people think of Sharia, they think of a government enforced law which allows brutal forms of punishment. First of, first of all, Islam, according to Islamic law, does not require any nation to impose certain punishments for criminal acts. Insta instead, Islam only recommends punishment for certain crimes. However, such a recommendation is not binding at all on the government. Islam merely suggests punishments that the state can choose to either ignore or bring into the law. Also, according to the Islamic law, an Islamic penal code can anyway not be enforced if the moral standard of that society is not being elevated. Simply applying Islam's penal code in a Muslim majority country without an effective effort to improve the moral and spiritual conditions of the citizens is not only ineffective but also counterproductive. In other words, Islamic punishments cannot be enforced in any immoral society and even, even if the society did elevate spiritually, it is really the decision of the government to decide whether to implement such punishments or not implement. Remember, religion cannot interfere with state matters and state matters cannot interfere with religious matters. In Islam, government does not need to accept any religious law. The only thing a government must do in an Islamic nation is to abide by the principles of Islamic governments, as did the Holy Prophet Islam wishes to prevent disorder and is a very much a staunch defender of the establishment of peace. The Holy Prophet wasallam, taught us how to always be loyal to one's nation and to obey those who are in authority over us. The teaching presented by the Holy Prophet wasallam, emphatically states that aside from extreme circumstances, the question of a refusal of obedience to a leader should never arise. In this respect, such a strict directive has been given that the Holy Prophet Wasallam states that even if the people notice their rights being violated, they should demonstrate patience, and if required, they should bear the tyranny and oppression of their rulers, but refrain from disobedience and rebellion. <laughs> Hence the Holy Prophet وسلم, states, O ye Muslims, after my demise, a time shall come when such people shall become rulers upon you who shall take away your rights and commit very hateful things. The companions asked, O Messenger of Allah, in such circumstances what should we do? The Holy Prophet وسلم, said, Fulfill the rights owed to your rulers and seek your rights from God. Then he goes further to state, A person who refuses to render obedience to the Amir and sets the foundation for division by separating himself from a unified community shall die a death of disbelief if he passes away before having repented. <coughs> However, along with this, the public has been urged to work towards reconciliation by giving righteous consultation, even if the Amir acts in a cruel and oppressive manner. In Islam, this, this struggle has been called a very great jihad and an act of goodness. The Holy Prophet ﷺ said, 
When a leader is guilty of tyranny and oppression, the greatest jihad is to strive in order to prevent the cruel and unlawful practices of the leader by exhorting him to act with equity and justice. However, what if the emir or the leader doesn't desist and remains adamant upon his unjust practices and issues commandments in direct contradiction with divine injunctions? The public has been given the right to obey the emir or the leader in everything righteous and lawful as usual, but to refuse obedience in anything which is unlawful. As such, the Holy Prophet ﷺ says, it is obligatory upon every Muslim to obey his emir, whether he agrees with a commandment issued by him or not. However, if he, if he issues a commandment which explicitly contradicts a divine law, then it shall not be compulsory, compulsory to obey such an order. Important to note that even in such a case, Islam does not approve that a person should raise the flag of rebellion whilst living in the sovereignty of an emir in a state of subservience. The purpose of this instruction is to prevent civil war from breaking out in the land and so that the dangerous state does not arise that people begin to stand up against a head of state whilst living under his rule. So, in such circumstances, the Islamic practice is to migrate from that country. After having left the country, if they believe that it is necessary and appropriate, they should work towards dismissing such a ruler. The migration of the Holy Prophet wasallam, also took place in accordance with this very same principle. In other words, when the Holy Prophet wasallam, became distressed by the cruelties and religious government in Mecca, he ultimately left the sovereignty led by the chieftains of the Quraysh. After this, God determined to overthrow their tyrannous regime by way of the Holy Prophet There is a lesson here for the wider Muslim community, especially the Muslims that were involved in the Arab Spring or those that are still fighting President Assad. Our beloved Holy Prophet made it very clear that a citizen of any type of government should not rebel or fight the leader whether or not he is good or bad. Instead, they should leave the country peacefully and ask Allah for their due rights and to pray for those in authority that they should come back and act with justice. During the Holy Prophet Wasallam's rule as the head of state, he introduced a system of tax in order for the state to look after the people and the needs of the state. He taught us that there should be a form of tax on the income of the citizens living in the state and benefiting from its governance. For Muslims, the interest system was abolished and instead money would not receive interest and that all Muslims had to pay zakat or, not, uh, or charity 2.5% of the unspent income in one year. The non-Muslims, however, were not forced to pay zakat and were not refrained from using interest, but instead were asked to pay tax. Although this concept may seem objectionable to some, however, it was with these very funds that the government would safeguard their rights and for the welfare <coughs> and would make armies available for their wealth protection and for their own personal protection. The tax levied on Muslims was much higher than the tax levied on non-Muslims. This was because both religious and political needs of the country were funded by the Muslim taxes. But the non-Muslim taxes were lower since the state was not asking them to support religious needs, hence highlighting a strong adherence to the principle of absolute justice and ensuring that religion and state matters always remain separate. In terms of the amount paid by non-Muslims, the Holy Prophet ﷺ did not quantify the amount, but instead left it open according to the circumstances of every era and nation. The Holy Prophet ﷺ instructed less well-off people of the state to pay more than the less well-off. The Holy Prophet ﷺ instructed well-off people of the state to pay more than the less well-off people of the state. If one contemplates on the concept of tax paid by non-Muslims, it is a direct proof of the immense integrity of Islam and the founder of Islam. 
The duty of any government is to ensure proper education is given to all its citizens. It was therefore also the duty of the government of the Islamic nation to provide free education for all its citizens. This was emphasized by the Holy Prophet ﷺ. He was himself so anxious concerning education that any Meccan prisoner of war who was literate could earn his freedom if he could teach ten children how to read and write. This duty was so well discharged by the Holy Prophet ﷺ and his immediate successors that within a brief period of time, the camel drivers of the desert became teachers of the, of the world and the torchbearers of enlightenment. The Holy Prophet ﷺ taught us that if two brothers are fighting, it is the duty of the third brother to act justly and resolve the problem peacefully. It is indeed very sad to see how Muslim countries in the Middle East have forgotten the very basic principles of governance that our dear Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam established for us 1400 years ago. It is the duty of Muslim nations to help bring about peace and resolve conflicts of neighboring countries according to Islamic teachings, but this is also being ignored. There are so many areas of Islamic governance which have not only been misunderstood but grossly misapplied. I hope this speech has brought to your attention that if a country did implement a true Islamic state, not ISIS Islamic state, but an Islamic state that was established by the Holy Prophet wasallam, not only would it be acceptable by all and peaceful in every respect, it would allow progression it would allow freedom of religion, it would bring peace and equality and justice and law and order will follow. The leader of the state would have to be someone honest and would, be, would carry the burden of trust given to him by the people and will implement justice at all times. Every decision that the leader would take would be through democratic or consultative methods and would remember that these very decisions would make him answerable to a higher supreme being. The leader will use a just economic system to ensure that there is no poverty in the state and that there is no reason for the people to rebel against him. The leader would be constantly binded to the principles of absolute justice, the principles of Islamic governance as established by the Holy Prophet May At the end, May Allah help alleviate the sufferings in the world and also help our brothers, Muslim brothers and sisters and everybody around the world to understand the true Islamic principles of an Islamic nation and to understand that the Muslim leaders come back to ensure that the Muslim leaders come back to the teachings of Islam and correctly follow the actions of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillah. Jazakallah. Tuan Ayas Mahmud Ahmad dari Singapura. Tuan, Tuan kalau perlu itu apa translation boleh ambil ya, dari sana. Uh, seterusnya, oh ini adalah ceramah yang terakhir lah ya, bagi Jalsa Salana ini. Kebetulan tiga ceramah hari ini. Emergence of extremism and its destruction of Islamic nations. Ataupun uh, apa, uh, Wujudnya ekstremis Atau munculnya ekstremis ya, Dan kehancuran Negara-negara Islam Kerana akibat ekstremis ini Ceramah ini akan Disampaikan oleh Maulana Musa Masran Dari Malaysia So this uh, speech will be delivered in English By Maulana Musa Masran Dari Malaysia أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ودولة شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبد الرسول أما فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نمت عليهم Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
the Holy Quran says, whoever kill a person, he shall be as if he had killed all mankind. The Holy Quran, chapter 5, verse 33. Today, I would like to talk of the topic, the emergence of extremism and its destruction of Islamic nations. Islam has become tainted by violent terrorism, war, jihad, Muslim refugees, poverty, extremism, and so many negative things which are aligned to Islam, but which have been attached to Islam. This unity among the Muslim nation had made it easy for their enemies in opposition of forcing them into chaos political upheaval and race war and the use of terror, jihad and violence in order to rule. Indeed, for the past 200 years, the Islamic world had been divided and future looked grim. Spiritually, they have lost direction and leadership. Frustration led them to chaos extremism, militancy and terrorism and the recent Paris terror attacks and the ongoing war in Syria and latest had led to fears of the Third World War. The questions are, why cannot the Muslim world work together? Why are leaders always too unjust toward their own subjects? Why do they constantly choose war rather than peace? And why is extremism the chosen tool for their survival. We, in the Muslim world, must pause and seek a better alternative for the long-lasting peace in the world. The late Hazrat Kaftu Masi, the fourth in his book, Murder in the Name of Allah, explained, the expression of violence is symptomatic of many diseases in society. The Muslim world today doesn't know which way to turn. People find themselves dissatisfied about many things over which they have no control whosoever. They are death meat for exploitation by their own corrupt leaders or agents and stages of the foreign powers. Bloody revolutions are totally alien to the philosophy of Islam and have no place in Islamic countries. The late Husus continue, it is my deeply root belief that not only Islam but also no true religion whatsoever name can sanction violence and bloodshed of the innocent men, women, children in the name of God. God of love, God is peace, love never begets hatred, and peace can never lead to war. The holy founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadian, born in 1835, 1908, who claimed to be the promised Messiah and the second coming of Jesus, says, Islam, such a religion, which does not need the support of sword for its propagation, rather the inherent excellence of its teaching, its true and enlightenment, reasoning, argument, and active assistance of God to exalt the science and his personal attention are such matter that drive, <coughs> always drive its progress and propagation. In England, France, <coughs> and other European countries, Islam is very harshly criticized to have been spread by use of force. The real truth is that this rebellion had been spread by the Mulvis the Islamic cleric, who are the unwise friends of Islam. They did not understand the reality of Islam. This advice was given by the promised Messiah more than 125 years ago to the Muslim community to remind them not to distort the beauty of Islam because they misunderstood the meaning of jihad. Have they taken care or listened to the word of the promised Messiah they wouldn't be in the terrible situation as today. 
The Promised Messiah in his book, The British Government Jihad, and various other books said, because of the failure to understand the philosophy of the issue of jihad and its reality, the people of this age, as well as the Middle Age, were gravely mistaken, and we have to admit with great embarrassment that their dangerous mistake provided opportunity to the opponent of Islam to criticize the pure and the holy religion like Islam, which is nothing but a reflection of the law of nature and manifestation of mighty of God. Again, the promised Messiah salam, says, the people who call themselves Muslim but are convinced that Islam should be spread by sword are not aware of the inherent excellence of Islam and their action are like the action of the bees. The promised Messiah came to the world to remove the notion of raising the sword for the sake of religion. Now God, the exalt, desired to remove all the objections raised by the wicked people against the pure religion of Islam. Today, the method of terror, cruelty, violence, and mass murder had been used by the Islamic State also known as the Islamic State of Iraq and Al-Sham, ISIS, not only for the Muslim people but the Christian community in Iraq, giving a grim picture of Islam as religion of extremism. The method of ISIS had been condemned throughout the world, including the Muslim community. ISIS or ISIS, the Islamic State regard Shiism is an innovation and that innovate of the Quran is to deny its initial perfection. That means roughly 200 million Shia a month for death. So two are the head of the state of every Muslim country who have elevated man-made law about Sharia by running for office or enforcing law not made by God. The promised Messiah salam command. The method of jihad practiced by most of these barbarians of this age is not the Islamic jihad. Rather than these are the patient of Nasri Amara, obstinate self that incite to evil, or treacherous act based on the vain desire to achieve heaven that has spread among the Muslim. The current practice found among the Muslim to attack the people of other religion which they call by the name of jihad is not jihad according to the Sharia Islamic law rather it's clearly a violation of the instruction of God and messenger and a grave sin. In fact the concept of jihad as found in their heart is not right and it's begin with the murder of human sympathy. Graham Wood <coughs> And his article say, to take one example, in September, Sheikh Abdul Muhammad al adani Islamic State chief spokesperson, called on the Muslims in the Western country, such as France and Canada, to find an uh, infidel and smash his head with rocks, poison him, run him over with a car, or destroy his crops. The promised Messiah salam, said, <coughs> explained, could be considered a good act. For example, there's a person walking in a bazaar engulfed in his own thought and a complex stranger to us, and we do not even know his name and neither does he know us, but we fire a gun at him with intention of killing him. Is this religious act? If this is a good act, then the bees are far better than human beings and carry out good deeds. Did God instruct us to cut a person into pieces without any proof of crime or kill him with a gun while we do not even know him? Neither does he know us. Can such a religion be from God that teach to start killing sinless? Indonesian people of God without any excuse in reservation and without even delivering them the message and that it will lead us to heaven. It is pitiful and shameful that a person 
with whom we have no previous enmity and is a complete stranger to us while he is buying something for his children from a store or busy in some other lawf lawful act and we without any tr reason fire a gun at him and make his wife a widow and his children often and turn house into a place this morning. Which hadith mentioned this practice? Which verse of the Holy Quran mentioned this? Is this, is there any Mulvi who could answer this? The unwise people have heard the name of jihad and using it as an excuse of fulfilling their vain selfish desire or as carrying out glory act because of their insanity. When no one kill Muslim for the sake of religion, I wonder under what authority they kill innocent people. Bin Laden <coughs> view his terrorism as a prologue to a caliphate he did not expect to see in his lifetime. His organization was flexible, operating as a geographically diffused network of <coughs> autonomous cells. The Islamic State, by contrast, required territory to remain legitimate and top-down structure to rule it. The promised Messiah explained the confusion of understanding of the issue of jihad. The understanding of the issue of jihad of the current day Islamic scholar who are called Mulvi and the method of presentation of this issue to the common people is definitely wrong. It is only the outcome is that they, with their passionate speech, turn barbaric nature human being into beastly people and strip them off all the noble quality of human being. This is exactly what happened, and I know for certain the sin of all the unjust <coughs> justified kill, killing by these unwise and selfish men who are unaware of hidden reason for the need of war by Islam in its early age is, is on the neck of this Mulbi who secretly teach them the matter that lead to the painful carnage. The ignorant Mulvi, may God guide them, have greatly deceived people who are like a flock and have declared this act keys of heavens, which clearly unjustified merciless and again the human morale. These people are so much entrenched in the belief of in this belief of jihad, which is totally wrong. And again the teaching of Quran, Hadith, that anyone who does not accept this belief, they oppose him and brand him as Dajjal, great imposter or deceiver, and declare him deserving to be killed. So for a long time I have been under this edict as well. As that Mr. Mahat Ali Salam remind Muslim, Islam definitely does not teach Muslim to become robbers and bandits and fulfill their selfish desire using the pretext of jihad. Graham would add, if Al-Qaeda wanted to revive slavery, it's never said so. And why would it? Silence on the slavery probably reflects strategy thinking with the public sympathy in mind. When the Islamic State began enslaving people, even some of its supporters barked. Nevertheless, the Caliphate has continued to embrace slavery and crucifixion without apology. We will conquer your room, break your crosses, enslave your women. Adnani, the spokesman, promised in one of his periodic Valentines to the West. If we do not reach that time, then our children and the grandchildren will reach it, and they will sell your son as slave at the slave market. As it Masimut says, Muslims should appreciate enlightenment and blessing descending from heaven at this time. And thank God they exalt. But if they do not appreciate this reward of God they exalt, God the Exalt will not care about them at all and will certainly complete his task. Allah the Exalt has will to wipe out the other religion 
and get victory and strength to Islam. Now there is no hand or power that God stand in the way of the will of God to exile. <clears throat> the real issue of the Muslim nation today, as Caliph Masi the fifth, <coughs> Ayatollah Ibn Raz explained, unfortunately, the disorder of the Muslim country have tarnished the name of Islam. How we wish that Muslim country would understand how much damage their policy pursuing their own personal interests has caused to Islam and extremism and extremism organization had come into being in game string because this same self interest pervaded the scene everywhere. The peace of entire nation being such never did themselves enjoy peace, nor are they the soul, the source of peace for others. Furthermore, says Hazrat Capital Masi the fifth at the library. The promised Messiah Salam state at one place in this connection that so long as the government and the citizen continue to behave with justice toward each other, peace reign in the land. But when any injustice surfaces from the people or from the ruler, then the peace of the land is disturbed. Unfortunately, this is all that we witness taking place in most Muslim country. And on top of this, we see that the entries who are the enemy of Islam also engage in trying to benefit from this condition. According to the Graham word, tens of thousands of foreign Muslims are thought to have emigrated to the Islamic State. Recruits hailed from France, United Kingdom, Belgium, Germany, Holland, Australia, Indonesia, United States, and many other countries may have come to fight and many intend to die. Regarding territory, Hazrat Kapil Masih the fifth at Lebanon is explained, Islam does not need any force or might to spread. It is need of people who have absolute faith in God, whose standard of worship of God <coughs> are high and who rather than perpetrated murder and mayhem, engage in jihad again their serve to make themselves better people. It is a great tragedy of the state of Muslims that on the one hand, they reject that God can still send down revelation, and on the other hand, they try to spread Islam through force and oppression, and by murdering innocent people. The recent Paris attack were intense barbaric. These people are not garnering God's grace, rather, the Ghana is chattisman. In this regard, there's a huge responsibility on the Ahmadis to elevate the level of worship of God as well as spread message of teaching of Islam. Hazrat Kafir the Masih the fifth at Labrazis eight. Religious extremism. B is Christian extremism. Muslim extremism or any kind is never a true reflection of that religion. Regarding the claim of various groups to having established a Khilafat or Caliphate, Hazrat Kalfutul Masih the fifth at Lamarazi said, Khilafat was linked directly to the prophethood. He said that those extremist groups that have claimed Caliphate Reason have not followed any form of prophethood. Instead, were only involved in inflicting cruelty, injustice, and barbarism of very highest order. Referring to this position as the fifth caliphate of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, <coughs> said, I never have any desire to be caliph. Rather, I was compelled to take this position by God Almighty who put my name in the heart of the people, member of the Trekkal College. Upon being asked about the greatest threat to civilization, as that <coughs> Mr. Masur Ahmad al said, I believe that the biggest threat today is the increasing distance between mankind and God Almighty. We're seeing fairness and justice decrease while cruelty and hatred rise. Such behavior and trend 
can only lead to the punishment of God Almighty. Therefore, <clears throat> the need for all people and organizations to promote peace and justice, the discord within various countries, the rise of terrorism and extremism, the devastating effect of a potential nuclear war, and the effort of the Ahmadi Muslim Jamaat to promote peace in the world based on the true teaching of Islam. At the international level, government and nation were jealous eyeing upon the races of other countries while major power were consumed by desire to maintain their power. But the more terrorists were waging war and killing nation people to fulfill their own vested interests. Despite <coughs> the worrying state of the faith, Hazrat Kapil Masih the fifth counseled that it was essential that those who desire peace do not become disheartened and frustrated. Instead, the need to increase the effort to bring about real and positive change in the world. As a capital Masih the fifth has cautioned that if immediate action was not taken to establish peace, then the alternative was truly frightening. One likely scenario will be the outbreak of the nuclear war in which the majority of the world will be consumed and whose consequence will last for generations to come. Citing the example of Japan, <coughs> is that the nation and the people of Japan were more fearful and horrified by the prospect of war than any other, and this was because Japan was the one country that had been targeted by nuclear bombs. Although seven decades had passed, the country was still bearing the scar and effect of World War II. <coughs> Hazrat Kaplamasi V also said, if nuclear war break out, and we will find people will instantly die and freeze like statue, and the skin will simply melt away. The weapons available today are so destructive and they could lead to generation after generation of children being born with severe genetic or physical defect. Drinking water, food, and vegetation will be all contaminated by radiation. We can only imagine what type of disease such contamination will lead to. With the current situation in Syria, we are facing to delicate and dangerous situation, third world war. The world is fighting moving toward destruction. All the less Islamic nation will destroy. The extremism bring bad news to the Muslim world community. Hazrat Kapitul Masih, the fifth Ayatollah Brunaz explained, remind member of the Jamaat the following. I want to briefly say something on the current world situation. Member of Jamaat need to greatly turn to prayer in light of the way the world is fast moving toward destruction. And wake of barbaric even in France and their decision to take severe measure against the so-called Islamic State situated in Syria and Iraq, Western government now plan airstrike there. In fact, they have already begun airstrike. If this government want to carry out airstrike, they should aim them at those who are perpetrating cruelty. May Allah save the Indian public from this attack. Most people living in Syria enduring untold suffering. They have no way out. The neighboring Muslim country are also not serious about steaming this evil. What was needed was for neighboring countries to get together and help the government there to eliminate this evil. However, the evil was allowed to grow so much so that now it's spreading all over the world. Hazrat Kapitul Masih the fifth, I don't tell Aziz, predict the future of ISIS. Thus, it is also said that if the so-called Islamic State have to leave Iraq and Syria, its plan to make its station and seat of the government Libya, what will be the result of this? <coughs> Obviously, if it is to be eliminated, it is not a remote possibility that a strike will start in Libya and again, civili civilians will be killed. Western country first help this government and then turn again them and either change the regime or make effort to change it. The cause of the true picture of situation has at Capital Masih the fifth Ayatollah Bernardi is further add. It is as follow. The current disorder in the world 
is caused by the lack of justice perpetrated for every long period of time. Opportunately, Muslim government also practice injustice and cruelty in their own country. In short, the state of affairs is so complicated that it is like a world war in their own country. In short, the state of affairs is so complicated that it is like a world war situation. Although it should be said that the world war has begun on a small scale, many analysts here have said to acknowledge this and are writing that world war war has begun. I have been drawing attention to this for many years. Now others are also saying the same, yet it is appeared that neither the big power nor the Muslim government will be drawn to act with justice. On the face of it, it seemed that everyone together taking action against so-called Islamic State so that it may be eliminated and peace can be restored. However, certain matter indicate that even if this evil eliminated, the situation will not get better. Rather, later on, the big power will start their own skirmish and it's not unlikely for war to ensue. This is because grievance between Russia and other Western power are on increase and the outcome will once again be most loss of life among civilians. This is what we have seen in the past war that most life lost for those of Inusian civilians. Ahmadi Muslim <coughs> believe the promised Messiah and Imam Mahdi has come in the person of the founder of the Ahmadi Muslim community, His Holiness Hazrat Mizagulam Ahmad alayhi salam. Hazrat Mizimaud <coughs> alayhi salam explained, I have been sent at this time to save Islam from the attacks of the false religion to the present and the powerful argument for the truthful of Islam. I certainly said that Islam will be victorious. A sign had been appeared already. It is true that no sword or gun is required for this victory. And neither God has sent me with weapons. Anyone who thinks like this is an unwise friend of Islam. The purpose of religion is to conquer heart, and that cannot be done with the sword as so many times I have shown that the word sword picked up by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was only for the sake of self-protection and self-defense. And it was done only when the atrocity of the opponents of the denier had exceeded all limit and the earth and turned red with blood of the poor Muslim. In essence, the reason of my arrival is the victory of Islam on other religion. <coughs> The fifth, Ayatollah <coughs> Bunayi said, as I already <coughs> said, Islam has taught that you must never assist in cruelty or oppression. It is this beautiful and wise teaching that lead the true Muslim to hold a position of honor and dignity within whichever country he lives. There is no doubt that all sincere and decent people will wish to have such peaceful and considerate people within their society. In conclusion, as at Kalpudumasi Hamis Adatrabinazi said, certainly it is true that Islam presented by the extremist terrorists does not have the ability to integrate with any country or society. Indeed, a time will surely come when the voice of opposition to such extremist ideology will be raised loudly even in the Muslim country. Nevertheless, the true Islam, which was brought by the Holy Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, will certainly always attract sincere and decent people toward it. And this area, to revive the original teaching, Allah sent the promised Messiah Wasallam in servitude to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, so his community practiced and preached the true message of Islam. <clears throat> May Allah enable us to do so. Amen. Allahu Akbar. 
Jazakumullah uh, Itu tadi Ulama Musa Masran Dengan ceramah beliau Emergence of extremism and its destruction of Islamic nations uh, Tuan-tuan yang mau, mau pergi Toilet Tuan-tuan boleh sebentar 5 minutes 10 minutes Kita masih banyak waktu lagi ni Kerana hari ini uh, lunch is after 